you may have heard that in biology we've reached a data deluge, and, and you may think this is something that's just recently happened. But this is something that people have been talking about for more than a decade. For example, Carol Bolt and Judy Blake wrote this paper in 2005 that was published in 2006 that talked about how we were going to advance beyond the data deluge. And, and at that time, it seemed like there was a lot of data but it turns out we were just, this is when next generation sequencing was coming online, and so we were just learning uh, about the tip of the iceberg. In 2008, Wired Magazine actually wrote that we had rendered the scientific method obsolete. Uh, and, you know, there have been continuous articles since then. Here's one from 2011 in the New York Times, another one in IEEE Spectrum from 2013, a discussion of this in Nature Cell Biology in 2012. And so, so we've kind of reached this point now where it feels like we've got a lot more data than we really know what to do with. And so the focus of this module is on how we can actually harness the data deluge, so how we can take these data that we've collected at lower and lower cost, and how we can apply those to study questions that we really care about. So how can we sort of pull the biology that we want out of this giant sea of data? So now I'm going to introduce you to one type of data that we're going to talk about a fair amount throughout this uh, module, and I'm going to give you an idea for the sort of scope and scale of, of these data that exist in, in just publicly available resources that, that anyone can go download. And so this is right here is one um, gene expression experiment. So you could think of this as either a microarray or um, an RNA-seq experiment. And on average, uh, most experiments that people upload to publicly available databases, there's a couple big publicly available databases called uh, either Array Express or NCBI's Gene Expression Omnibus. And the average size of an experiment in, this, in these is about 10 assays. So you can imagine people have sort of five treatment and five controls or, or maybe groups of three um, sort of tr uh, control and two treatments. Um, and this is kind of the, the average size experiment. If we take this entire block of sort of one average size experiment, we can then represent that as maybe a box of a different color. So here, every blue box represents 10 uh, microarray or RNA-seq assays. And then we can sort of group these into a group of 10 of these as well. And this gives us about the size of an organism like um, Pseudomonas syringae's compendium. So a non-model organism, um, something that's sort of related to, a, to a, an organism that's either pathogenic or that we study a lot, but, but that itself is, is sort of not heavily studied and not a model. If we compress each of these blue blocks down into one of these orange blocks, uh, and then we have 10 of these, now we're in the world of a model organism that's used to study a specific process. So something like Pseudomonas aeruginosa, which is used to study biofilm formation, and also happens to be a pathogen. Um, so these aren't the most commonly used organisms, but, but they're used um, pretty widely in, in molecular biology. And we can keep going up different orders of magnitude. So at about 10,000 assays, now we're looking at the size of sort of all gene expression assays that have been made publicly available for zebrafish. At 100,000, we end up at rats. And in total, there's about 1.8 million genome expression assays that you can go download right now for free um, from these repositories. And it turns out that if you're only interested in humans, there's about 900,000 of these that are currently available. So, so this is an idea of what type of data deluge we're dealing with. So 900,000 genome-wide assays that anyone can go download. And it doesn't seem like this is slowing down. So if we look at one recent experiment, they generated uh, transcriptomic measurements for an additional 45,000 transcriptomes. This is one experiment published in 2015. And so they generated you know, these 45,000 transcriptomes, which are, uh, add a significant amount to the 900,000 that were already available. And so, so this is one form of the data deluge that we're dealing with. What we're really trying to do and what we're trying to, the skills we're trying to impart to you in this module are to help you get from sort of maybe one of these compendiums, so maybe these 900,000 different genome-wide gene expression experiments, and we'd like to be able to then help you use those to um, answer specific biological questions, like given all this available data, which genes control progression through the cell cycle? Or, you know, given all this available data, does it look like there are multiple different types of breast cancer at the gene expression level? To do this, we're going to introduce you to a, a field of computer science called machine learning, um, which sounds really intimidating, but which it turns out you probably use all the time. 
So for instance, uh, if, you're, if you've ever used Netflix, the, the engine that recommends uh, what movies you're likely to like uh, has been trained on movies that, you, that you've rated in the past and from that can predict in the future which movies you'll enjoy watching. And uh, if you've ever purchased anything that was recommended for you, those recommendations are coming out of a machine learning algorithm. And if you need to make slides for a lecture, for instance, and you've used Google Image Search to pull up the Netflix logo, this also uses machine learning. And so, you know, we're really using machine learning throughout our daily lives, and it's impacting us in lots of ways. And so what we're going to help you learn here is how we can take that, uh, these techniques that are broadly used and apply them in biology. And so these, th these techniques in biology can, for instance, help you identify that there are multiple different subtypes of, of ovarian cancer. This is just one example that we'll go through. To give you an idea of the goals that we have with this machine learning module, which will cover five class periods, we're going to help you learn how to choose effectively between the supervised and unsupervised approaches, which are two different types of techniques. We're going to help you learn how to describe the intuition behind uh, one specific unsupervised algorithm and one specific supervised algorithm. By the end of this, you'll be able to apply a supervised machine learning algorithm. You'll be able to assess the construction of the model from that algorithm. And you're going to be able to predict that model's performance in the future. So we're looking forward to giving you the tools that we think you're going to need as you approach the biological sciences in, in this era of big data.